hawks and uh, all the water birds and stuff. It's really amazing. Summer, people tend to take birds for granted. But listen, here's the deal. If birds don't reproduce, we lose them. And we're losing them fast in this country. So um, it's interesting to see who actually reproduces here. The spring fall birds are from the tropics to up north. So they're not really our birds. The, even though we have a great birding festival in April, let me tell you, Feather Fest is fantastic. The wintering birds really belong to Canada and up north, but they just come down here to spend the winter and then they go back. But our breeding birds are really important and some of them need uh, a lot of concern and others of them have, have been a real problem in the distant past like brown pelicans and to our credit, we have brought them back. Uh, believe it or not, uh, they're the state bird of Louisiana, and Louisiana used to not have any brown pelicans because of DDT. Uh, now they do, and everybody else does, but don't take it for granted because uh, we almost lost ours as well. So I want to uh, just go through here and look at about uh, 32 breeding birds that we have. I'm going to try to do this in the dark, sort of. Okay, this is the laughing gull, and everybody knows them with that black head. There are some other gulls with black heads, but we don't have them here much. There, I'm just, we're just seeing them up in Alaska, um, which is where I was before Jerry contacted me. There's nothing, I would never say no to Jerry about anything. So, so uh, we were very happy to, to come back down. Um, but laughing gulls are, are doing just fine. But the amazing thing is we discovered that they have an amazing migration that nobody ever saw coming. They migrate in a circular pattern around the Gulf of Mexico. And I mean, I'm an ornithologist. I did my master's work right here on Galveston Island, and I've never heard of anything like that either. But uh, they will begin here in Texas and sometimes go down to Cancun or whatever, cut across the Gulf show up in like Miami, um, come up uh, to Tallahassee, Florida State. Uh, that's where I got my uh, education. And uh, come across the Gulf Coast. And so they're, they're really, a, really an interesting thing. And you'd think such a normal, ordinary, common bird wouldn't have uh, such neat secrets. Um, you recognize this one, I'll bet. Um, this is the great tail grackle. It's not everybody's favorite bird, <laughs> but they're pretty interesting. They uh, they used to be more tropical, more like in Mexico, many, many, many decades ago. And I know a lot of people are thinking we couldn't fill that wall tall enough to keep them out. But, but uh, the great tail grackles um, are. Uh, they, they do some good things. They certainly get rid of a lot of trash and garbage around, um, but they, they can be a bit of a nuisance at times. Here's the females, and you may not recognize that those brown birds are also great tailed grackles, um, but they nest in little colonies around. You'll see uh, uh, maybe some cattails out in a, in a marsh or something, and there'll be a whole bunch of them in there. Uh, they are colonial nesters. Uh, here's a male display using that great tail of his. Um, if you've ever been to wildlife refuges in Brazos Bend or whatever, they actually have another species there called the boat tail grackle, seriously. And that's what my acclamation is coming from Florida because we have like millions of boat tail grackles there. Okay, uh, a bird that I bet a lot of people like is the cardinal and we have them on Galveston Island, and they are totally non-migratory. In fact, I see the same cardinals every day at my bird trip and my feeder. Now, I live in Indian Beach, and I'm in that wooded lot way back in the back, and uh, I've been there almost 27 years, and actually, I have the largest yard list of birds in the history of North America. That's how good Galveston is at birds. Uh, and by the way, these are photographed and, and the records sent in and everything. There's, uh, there's no tomfoolery going on. Uh, actually, I would say three of the top four ever have been in the state of Texas, so, which tells you how good Texas is uh, for birds. Now, uh, 
due to attrition and death and whatnot. Um, I'm the only one left above 300, but 324 may be uh, the highest ever forever. <laughs> we'll see. Um, here's the starling, which is interesting because it's really iridescent and you see them sit sitting around near the road and whatnot and the sun beams all kinds of colors off of them. They're actually from Africa originally through Europe and here and in Africa uh, there are a whole bunch of really neat starlings over there. Um, now we're going to look at a two of our commonest shorebirds and if you go fishing or walking on the beach or driving or whatever you see these this is the ruddy turnstone on the right and that's a cool name they leave no stone unturned uh, getting little uh, bugs out from under the rocks and the sanderling on the left is our commonest shorebird you'll see them too they run around and, and grab little uh, aphids and different kinds of insects on the beach um, so they're really cute and really tame. This is the willet, and I know you've seen this one too. It's a big gray shorebird, but they have those black and white stripes in the wings. Um, willets um, were actually two species, and for centuries, we didn't realize that. We thought they were all one species, and then a guy noticed that in August, when nobody's bird watching, um, one population leaves and another one comes in. And then in March, when everybody's getting ready for warblers, they switch places again. But there is now an Eastern Willet and a Western Willet. And these Eastern Willets nest right down here in our salt marshes, like at uh, San Luis Pass. And on nights with a full moon, they can keep you awake. The males are up flying around and hollering. I don't know what they're concerned about, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, this is the house sparrow and they're in a lot of places right along the beach and, and in the residential areas. And that's another immigrant from uh, Europe. You think of starlings and house sparrows and pigeons. We definitely need a wall for those. They have done nothing but spread diseases. Okay, uh, mockingbird, this is our state bird and I can't get away from them. They're also the state bird of Florida. Um, as well as we had the same name of a governor where I used to live and he came out here and his brother was the governor here. That's Governor Bush. So uh, get some names in common with Florida. Uh, this is a, the Mockingbird and they are really interesting because um, I, I know the bird songs, you know, so I can listen to a Mockingbird and sometimes they'll imitate 12 or 15 species of birds. And uh, that's pretty good for a bird that has a brain, you know, the size of a marble. Um, Here's one you might recognize. Um, this is the frigate bird. Yeah, uh, they're essentially tropical and they breed uh, on the Texas coast, generally further south, but during the breeding season, they come up here all the time. Uh, the warmer it gets, the more you see. And if you go across the ferry, that's the best place to see them is the Bolivar Ferry. You'll see them up in the air. Um, these that have the white chest are females. The males are all black. The immatures have a white head but um, these are not fan favorites with other birds like gulls and terns. Uh, you can see that long hooked bill they have. They will chase down other birds and uh, take away their fish or whatever the bird's gonna eat. Or sometimes they'll just take the bird itself if it's small enough. So they're, they're a pretty wicked bird. Um, their nickname is Man of War Bird, which um, that was a ship from Spain, is that right? Was that a man of war? Okay, whatever. But anyway, they're called magnificent frigate birds, neat birds. Okay, um, one that nests in our woodlands, and I'll bet a lot of people haven't seen them here nesting, is the green heron. But they're really pretty birds. They have a reddish neck and kind of a greenish, uh, green blue back and. Um, Colorful, unlike most herons and egrets, which generally aren't colorful, um, but they'll just pick one little spot in a forest and uh, and go nest there. So neat having those. Um, this is the Forester's Turn, and gulls and terns are closely related, but they actually have a completely different biology. Gulls patrol the beaches and eat 
dead fish and stuff that washes <laughs> in. Generally not live food. Uh, it's kind of like kind of like hawks and vultures. Um, the terns, though, are quite skilled flyers, and they'll hover up above the water and wait for a fish to come up near the surface, and they dive in and spear the fish. Uh, so that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, we have eight species of terns down here, so when I have clients with me, I'll point out this one, and I'll just say, you know, one good turn deserves another. <laughs> okay, um, this is the other turn that you see so much here in Galveston, and that's because they feed that away, and they nest that away up in the bay. Um, I think last year, 28,000 pairs, that's a lot. This is the royal turn, and they're a large turn. They have kind of a yellowish red bill. Um, and this is probably the place where there are the most royal turns in the world, right here. So we have a lot in Galveston to be proud of. Um, let's see. Oh, that's a, another picture of that willet I told you about. I should have stuck them together. but. You don't see the black and white wings until they until they fly, and uh, then you know they're willets. Um, right down Stewart Road here, we have nesting pipeville greaves, and you can tell they're in breeding plumage because they have the black on the throat. You see that? Yeah, it shows it in front of the eye. But with it is a baby, and the babies have a real mottled, uh, colored head and neck. Um, and we are the first island in the Gulf of Mexico to have nesting um, pipeville greaves. They're on hardest food land, so they're safe. Um, and that's a, a really big step for the bird. So um, good that we're providing some good things for birds. This is the yellow crowned night heron. They're a nocturnal bird. Uh, they do have bigger eyes than regular herons and egrets, so you can tell they're nocturnal. Uh, they're kind of stocky and they come out at night and feed at night, but they also nest on the island in a few places. And sometimes when their trees are up above a driveway and there's you know, somebody's jaguar down there in the driveway, uh, it's not appreciated, but herons, like most animals, have to relieve themselves. Um, so the Humane Society or the cops or somebody will get called about it. But um, federal law, stipulates that you can't mess with uh, our migratory birds nesting or their chicks or eggs or, or them, period. Uh, we could probably make quite a case for um, people driving through flocks of birds out on the beach uh, and those birds are needing to digest the fish and stuff that they've eaten. Uh, that would probably be a pretty good ticket, uh, but my lips are sealed. Um, these are uh, black bellied whistling ducks, and you guys have been around, you know that we haven't always had these. Uh, this is another one that's come up from the south. Uh, you would expect some birds to move further north if a planet is warming, and of course ours is, so we get tropical birds that are beginning to move into our area. At the same time, sadly, we don't get a lot of the wintering birds we used to get because the earth is not as cold as it used to be. Although the last two Februarys, we've had a pretty good first week of <laughs> snow and ice and whatnot. Um, but averages are averages. And um, we hope that the birds will be able to uh, make it okay with climate change. Um, these birds have fairly large broods uh, and they're just as tame as they can be. Uh, they'll swim right by you and they just don't look like wild birds at all but they do come from an area of the world where there weren't many guns in these natural areas, so they just assume that we're okay up here. And as far as I know, nobody's messing with them. They're not a, a game bird, by the way. You might recognize this bird as a cormorant. It's called a neotropic cormorant. And once a year, usually between Halloween and, and um, Thanksgiving, they'll start getting white on their head. And this says, I'd like to get married. Um, and they, a maid comes up adoringly and they decide to uh, nest. And there are some nesting places around. The best one is at High Island. Yeah, how many of y'all have been to the rookery at High Island? 
pretty pretty cool, huh? It's an amazing place. Not only do they have hundreds of nesting neotropic cormorants, but they've got some herons and egrets, and of course, roseate spoonbills. They call it the spoonbill rookery. Listen, no kidding. In late April or early May, you have got to go over to High Island and see that rookery. It's just amazing. Go in the afternoon when the sun will be at your back and you can take fantastic pictures. That is one of the real gems of the Gulf Coast. Okay, um, have you seen these ducks that look like female mallards, but they're down in the ditches and a lot of times in the spring they have chicks with them? Those are called model ducks. And unlike most of the other ducks, they don't go up north to breed. They breed right here. And they also get ridiculously tame. Uh, but they'll have broods sometimes of 10 and 12. And sadly, as the days go by, it'll go to 11 and then 10 and then nine. But we presume that the very best survive and pass on their genes to future generations, which is how it's supposed to work. Um, they're kind of speckled all over, which is how they get the name modeled. And um, oddly, there's a bunch of them in Florida and a bunch of them in Texas. And being a Florida boy that moved to Texas, I can tell you there's a lot of similarities between birds in Texas and birds in Florida, like sandhill cranes and caracaras and all kinds of cool stuff. We don't have sandhill cranes here in the summer, <clears throat> so they're not a breeding bird, so they're not in the program. Here's one that is, so this is the killdeer, and killdeers nest um, in places like golf courses, <laughs> places where you have a lot of grass, even people's lawns, and they have two rings around them. Now, there are some other plovers that have one ring, but these have two, and their young one will have one ring for a while, and then it'll split into two. Uh, the young one's the one that's in focus, that was the that was what I was shooting at. Um, and you can see how cute they are, but I've, I've seen them in many places. And you know, it's sad once in a while, a dog or a cat or a car or something takes out one, but most people are pretty sensitive to birds, especially baby birds, you know, and want to see them survive. And it's, it's really amazing. One of the things that killdeer will do to save their young is uh, let's say a, a dog or a cat or a hawk or something comes around, um, the adult bird will start flopping off, dragging its wing like this and looking, uh, can't use the CR word, wounded. Uh, wounded. Yeah, wounded, there you go, they look wounded. Um, and um, <laughs> these poor animals will go after it for 100 yards, 150 yards, and how the kill deer can move that fast acting messed up is something I totally don't understand. But then finally the, the, the predator will give up and fly away or run off and then they'll fly in a big semicircle back to their young and like, it's okay now, we can go back to doing what we were doing. That's called feigning, F-E-I-G-N, feigning. Okay, um, this was a, a new breeder for the island and uh, Jerry was the one that suggested the, the concept of breeding birds. I thought, that's a really good idea because um, we have some neat breeding birds here and these least bitterns come in in March and April and they will find a place in the cattail marsh that they feel good about and uh, build a nest back in it a little bit so you can't see it very well. They want to camouflage. But then they'll go out to the edge of the cattails and they have enormous feet. <laughs> and they will hold on to the bottom of the cattail and when a minnow comes up to the surface they'll snatch it right off the surface but if danger comes around bitterns are famous for sticking their head neck and bill straight up in the air and freezing and that makes them look just like the cattail and it's a way that they're able to survive you know birds that have ways of surviving are really doing well in, in many cases. Uh, in 1860, we reached a human population of, of a billion, and now we're right at eight billion, eight times as many humans with cars and roads and BB guns and you know dogs and whatnot. 
Uh, it's, it's getting tough for birds to survive. So it's, it is interesting to see uh, how some find ways of surviving and, um, and neat that Audubon societies and other organizations will set aside land just for birds and other animals. And my property is that and um, when the day comes that I depart this planet, uh, it will be protected by some organization so that those birds um, and other animals will be okay. Even the cotton mouse out in my yard, which scare the heck out of me once in a while, but they're protected. Okay, um, we have some nesting spoonbills out in the, in the bay, and you've probably seen them if you've been out there. But again, the very best place to see nesting spoonbills is um, High Island at the Rookery. I'm, I'm serious, if you've not been there, this is a place you need to go. And now their board has spent tons of money on building a kind of a sky deck that goes through the trees and down to the rookery and you just stand there and there are hundreds and hundreds of birds everywhere. Well, well worth the trip. Okay, I bet you know this one. This is the osprey and it is uh, one of the few raptors around the world that will feed on fish and they don't do what the herons and egrets do. They dive out of the air, you probably know that, and they have um, a very wide grasp on their feet, kind of like my fingers here, where one sticks out to the side. That's called semizygodactyl, and it gives them a really wide grasp. So when the trout or whatever starts coming up to the surface, they come out of the air feet first and just nail them and fly off with them and sit on a telephone pole or something and have dinner. But um, if any of you like fresh fish, you might want to come back as an osprey next time. <laughs> okay, uh, we are now getting the most abundant bird in North America finally nesting on Galveston Island. It's really funny. There's just millions of red-winged blackbirds. And, you know, they'll show up here once in a while, but they've never nested. And then by golly, right out by my house, I live in Indian Beach, uh, they are now nesting red-winged blackbirds, and uh, one young one came to um, my seed feeder to try out seeds, and I think he was too young. Uh, really young birds shouldn't be eating seeds, so I whacked on the window with my knuckles and he took off. Uh, I'll never come back here again. But um, the red-winged blackbirds are, are not really a problem. They're not causing many of the problems that say grackles and starlings are causing. So uh, I accept them. And they're, they're a beautiful bird too. And you know what this is. This is the scissor tail flycatcher, state bird of, of Oklahoma. And um, we are way, way south in the breeding range. I don't think they breed anywhere south of here. Um, but we do have a few that come in off the Gulf of Mexico in April and they just look around and say, man, Galveston's is beautiful. Why would I want to go to Oklahoma? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and sure enough, uh, there's about uh, six or seven pairs, particularly I, I see them over on Setagas and, and they stay, spend the summer here. They're happy. They're very successful uh, raising their young. And uh, in October, they're headed for the tropics along with a lot of other birds. No. Oh. This is a beautiful bird, isn't it? Uh, this is the barn swallow, and you see them probably more than you realize what they are, but they're uh, this pretty little dark bird zipping along out over the grassland and whatnot here on the west end of the island. They also nest in uh, little wooden structures and stuff. They, they build their nests up out of the rain, and barn swallows are doing really, really well. Um, the interesting thing about swallows is they started nesting, several species like cliff swallows, started nesting underneath overpasses where the uh, interstates were. And the ornithologists and other bird people were like, oh no, some of them are gonna get hit. <laughs> well, they do, but here's the thing. You won't catch a predator around there. They know better than to try out those semis and speeding cars like mine does sometimes. Um, and so there's no predators. 
So yes, once in a while, a swallow gets clobbered by an automobile, but the absence of predators has made their population really skyrocket, especially cliff swallows and to a certain extent barn swallows. So you never know what's going to happen. Uh, we are learning a lot about birds as we do what we do out there and the birds try to do what they've been doing for thousands of years and some are successful and unfortunately some aren't. Um, here's uh, red-winged blackbirds and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, couldn't see the screen. Uh, these are brown-headed cowbirds and they nest here, but they don't really nest. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Okay, uh, interesting thing about cowbirds, they go out in the morning when their testosterone levels are high and they mate all over the place. You can see them mating. And then in the afternoon, they do more feeding. And when the female gets ready to lay an egg, they haven't built a nest. Oh gosh, I knew we forgot something. So they go around and do just what the cuckoos in the old world do. They drop their egg in the nest of some songbird somewhere. And I have had my cardinals, I wasn't very happy about this, but I've had my cardinals show up at the bird feeder with this dinky little brown baby bird with them. And that was a cowbird that somebody, somebody, some female cowbird had placed in the nest. And they don't know that that isn't one of them. So the cowbird gets raised as a cardinal. Um, and I, it seems to be working because cowbirds are, are really abundant birds. Now, this is a kind of a bad thing because before we had so many agricultural fields, we didn't have a lot of cowbirds. Like, they don't have a lot of cuckoos in, in uh, the old world in Asia. Most of ours, most of our cuckoos are in Washington. Anyway, um, so, uh, but here we have now gotten so many cowbirds that they are really hurting the populations of some native birds. And I know what you're thinking, oh God, these environmentalists, they always have to get off the well, it's just true. I mean, and, and we can pay for it or we can lose them. But there are factions within Texas that are getting rid of cowbirds. Believe me, they're not gonna go extinct. We're gonna always have millions and millions of cowbirds, but just trying to keep it. The number down will keep it from affecting other species as much. Just like the, the fight we have with Chinese tallow trees here on the island. You've seen us fruitcakes out there cutting down those trees and painting the wood with that herbicide. We are trying to make Galveston Island stay like it's been and not turn into huge tallow forests like we have all the way up the interstate. And that's a lot of hard work and if you want to help, we'd love to help. Okay, um, this is the morning dove and they nest in a lot of places and uh, sometimes you think uh, maybe they're taking over because it's like a coup. <laughs> but seriously, you can hear them cooing, uh, especially uh, sun up and sundown. They coo a lot, and sometimes during the middle of the day. Um, but they're they're surprisingly aggressive birds in a feeder. But uh, they're native species. You know, that's totally cool, and, and I like having them in the yard, just like I like all of my birds. Um, this is a guy that's um, probably not welcome at feeders as much as many birds. This is the loggerhead shrike. And you can see this big black mask on the face. Anytime you see an animal with a black mask like that means it's a predator, good sign there. And these guys will come right off the wires and nail mice and rats and baby birds and lizards and small snakes and just all kinds of things. But um, their population out here on the west end of the island is very stable. And yet in, in the United States, they are a species of special concern. So when we have a lot of a species that the government is concerned about, that's a good sign. That's showing that we are making a real contribution to conservation. Oh, um, I know about these, and I give a hoot about these too. Um, 
most of the year we have a pair of great horned owls in our yard and oh it's so neat uh hearing them booming outside especially it's just the first light you hear this it's like that it's really cool um but they eat um things like skunks and rats and stuff like that and um this time of year they leave for two or two and a half months and we don't know where they go we i think personally they go out to some of the offshore islands where the birds are nesting and um, i know that they have nested at one residence over by lafitte's cove because the gentleman was kind enough to take me and my group i run birding tours um, me and my group up there on the deck to see them and that was really cool and the owls had become kind of acclimated to the people they didn't give a hoot um, so um, that was a neat experience but yes we have great horned owls as i get more tired jerry i get corny i'm sorry about that okay um yeah you'll you'll care about this one a lot this is the cara cara and it's sometimes called a mexican eagle or, or words like that that reflect to mexico because there's so many of them down there and um many of them have you know gone over that wall and come up this way to patrol our our streets and whatnot for roadkill but the interesting thing is um in galveston they don't do the roadkill thing much everywhere else i mean all the other states arizona wherever where they go um they feed with the vultures on the carrion. But here in Galveston, they're almost entirely uh, rodiviorous. In other words, they eat rodents like rats and stuff like that. And we don't have any idea why that is. I have seen one out of the beach eating a dead fish. Um, and I told my group that since it was Friday, I thought maybe he was Catholic. I didn't know. <laughs> but, uh, and don't worry about the ethnic thing, because I get all the groups. I, we, we keep it fair. Uh, but anyway, this is the uh, crested Kara Kara, and good luck finding them nesting. They nest right here on the island in the state park. They have even nested in my yard, but they are the most secretive nesters of any bird, especially a bird that's very large. They're bigger than hawks. They're almost as big as eagles and about the size of an osprey. But you'll see them flying out there, and those white wingtips are the real key. Um, and by the way, birds with white wingtips never migrate, seriously, um, because migration will cause uh, real wearing of the tips of the wings, and that's why most birds have uh, darker wingtips. And there are even many white birds that have black wingtips, like white pelicans and white ibis and stuff like that. But these never migrate, so they never risk wearing their wingtips out. So consequently, they have white wingtips. Cool. Okay, we're almost done here. This is the Northern Harrier, another raptor. And I like bragging on this because there are no other nesting Northern Harriers within a thousand miles of here. It's, it's just amazing. But don't question me on this because they nest next door to me. <laughs> These things nest out in the field uh, just to the east of, um, of Indian Beach. And I've heard of a couple of other nesting records and they also are really um, clever about the way they hide from our species. Um, but this one was flushed at the wrong time because I had my shooting iron with me. I had my, my Canon camera um, and I got her. You can see she's brown and streaked underneath. That's for females. But males are almost like a seagull. They're, they're kind of gray. Uh, it's an odd color for a hawk. But they eat rats too. So the caracaras and the great horned owls and the, and the harriers and the coyotes uh, they they are all eating a lot of rats uh, by the way when i finish the talk remind me to show you what's on my screensaver uh, you ladies especially will really like it okay we are done while you think of your question give me just one second Oh, you can see it on there. Uh, I was going to hold the laptop. 
this is what happens when you get a degree in science. They don't teach you about this. They don't teach you about this kind of stuff. Oops. But right out my window at my drip yesterday, uh, I could see one creeping through the trees and uh, then his sister was right behind him and they both came up and they came up right to the very edge of my drip water where there are things all around them that help them hide. Uh, but these are two young coyotes, probably about eight weeks old. I'm, I'm not a mammalogist, but I'm kind of guessing here. Uh, I think they're about eight weeks old. And the first one I'm pretty sure was uh, the brother and the second one I think was the sister. But it was really cool seeing that. And um, I, wish, I wish that coyotes hadn't spread into this area uh, because it was the loss of the red wolf that caused it to happen. So you, know, you hate to see humans affecting things so much. But we've got them and uh, they are kind of wild animals. And uh, I don't think they're running around attacking people much. They may take a, a, a cat or a bird or something once in a while, but you know, that's, that's nature. But anyway, all kinds of interesting things happening here. Um, if you get on my list, sometimes I have bird days where we have a lot of birds and people can come and just sit on the couch and take pictures and ask questions and stuff. Um, so don't forget, you can get on my bird picture list. It's all free, nobody gets your name. And it would be glad to have you as, it would be great to have you as, as part of what we do here, um, seems like every day. Okay, uh, do you have any questions? Any bird questions or anything like that? Yes, ma'am. No, no, it's a girl responsible for it. Yeah, um, the uh, I knew I was going to forget one name. <laughs> How can I forget her? Huh? Rachel Carson. Rachel uh, Carson. This lovely lady back there is a. Uh, my girlfriend and we we hope more soon but we'll see um, I'm trying best I can um, Rachel Carson went to Congress and uh, that was in the 60s and there was just a bunch of old stuffy white men in there going what's this woman doing here I'm, I want to go get some coffee and she started talking to Congress about how DDT was thinning the eggshells of birds like pelicans so when mama bird sat on the eggs, they, you know, had scrambled eggs like many of us had this morning. And um, Congress listened. It wasn't easy, but they listened. And by golly, we outlawed DDT. That was the good news. The bad news is we sold it to South American countries. <laughs> Sounds kind of like the United States. Um, but um, anyway, they've come back. And now pelicans are very common birds. and. Uh, Thank you to, to Rachel Carson. Yes, sir. How about the martins? Interesting, people get confused about what martins are doing because they migrate so early. They actually arrive from the Amazon uh, in late January, and uh, by February, they're looking for places to nest. By March, they're all nesting and raising young, and here's the key. By late May, most of them are headed for South America. So while we still have some spring migrants of other species coming in off the water, coming to the new world here, our martins are leaving us. Uh, so it, it took me a while to figure out what was going on. I was doing the research on, on the migration of songbirds, but sure enough, you'll see the wire start filling up with purple martins in late May. And right now, July, the middle of July, whatever it is, uh, right now, probably 95% of our purple martins have exited the, the continent. There's a few still around. Someone was speaking to me about that earlier. Um, the latest martin record uh, was like right after Labor Day. So, and that's the very latest ever. And people watch purple martins, let me tell you. I get, I get calls about them. Thank you. I know it's been a long morning. Y'all, let me tell y'all are a wonderful audience being this nice and polite to all these speakers. Uh, it's just a good thing we had the shortest program last. Anyway, um, I, want, I want you to do something besides that. 
I want you to clap for a very old and dear friend of mine that I haven't seen in years, and it was great talking to him. How about Jerry Mon? Yeah. <laughs> Let's also help Jim with uh, some of his books that he has over there in Blyden. Uh, he's put a lot of effort on birding on West Galveston Island, and he's a legend. So we really thank you for coming here again, Steve. Um, there's no other questions. Our next meeting is, uh, let me see what we have here. It's August the 20th, and we're hopeful to have a uh, District 23 State Representative Forum. Uh, District 23 is, uh, uh, right now, it was uh, Mays Middleton uh, had that uh, area, and you met one of the candidates, uh, Terry Leo Wilson, she was here earlier, and uh, we hope to have the other candidate here. But uh, if there aren't any questions, thank you all for coming, and hope to see you on the 20th. Any other questions or anything? Welcome. Thanks so much for coming.